Okay, so I have now the pleasure to introduce to you Dan Lyons. I had the opportunity to meet him in the dinner tonight. Uh, he has been an animal advocate uh, for all his adult life. Uh, was a campaigner for Uncaged from 1994 to uh, 2012. He did tell me about um, an legal battle with pharmaceutical giant Novartis about releasing documents, um, uh, leaked documents to the public, which he won so that apparently in England now you should be able to do this sort of thing. Um, in 2008, he won the UK Political Studies Association Prize for the best PhD thesis in governance and public administration for his research into the evolution of British animal experimentation policy. He has also written an animal rights book in 2014 called The Politics of Animal Experimentation. And he is with the RSPCA, he told me all about the problems that he faces there with the pressure from the animal exploitation industry. So let's welcome Dan Lyons to his talk. Okay, thanks very much for coming this evening. Um, by way of introduction, there's the abstract in case you've not seen it. So by way of introduction, I'll just kind of briefly describe my um, advocacy and research journey, which could be summed up as a journey from uh, focusing on pushing animal rights moral theory to um, dealing with the harsh reality of social and political power. Um, and it was dealing with the UK government head on um, over the case that Martin mentioned, their blatant um, maladministration and disregard for illegal disregard for animal welfare. Um, that kind of showed me that moral arguments on their own have depressingly little purchase at the moment on policy making in Britain and I suspect most other countries. So as a result of that I developed an interest in understanding how government works in reality, particularly obviously in relation to animals, but in a way you've got to understand the way how government works in general in order to sort of see how animal protection fits into that. So understanding why the government is indifferent to animals, that understanding is obviously key to figuring out how to change that. And so this more empirical approach it, what, that, what that does is it provides a kind of metaphorical map showing the terrain we are operating on and the possible routes forward. Because without it, no matter how ethically correct we are, and obviously we are, we are unlikely to find a way to turn uh, our principles into something which is universally applied uh, for the sake of animals. Now, why is government important, you may ask? Well, I think the reason is, is whether we like it or not, ultimate power and authority to either allow or stop animal abuse kind of finally rests at the level of the state. I mean, it, you know, it's not, it doesn't act on its own, but if you think about the kind of the ecosystem of power in society, in a way, the state is the big beast. And obviously we'd rather have the state on our side than against us. And the political philosopher Thomas Hobbes famously said that without government, Life is nasty, brutish, and short. And if you look around the world uh, in places where there are failed states, that seems to be fairly true. And in fact, that's the reality for countless billions of animals across the world every year. And it's because government does not take their interests into account. Their lives are effectively outside the state's remit. And another reason in a way a more fundamental reason why government is critical actually relates back to a, a basic methodological point in social science. It's a basic fact of reality relating to human behaviour. In brief, human beings are not totally autonomous, rational creatures. Our decisions and behaviour are hugely influenced by our social and physical environment, which in turn is the, the product of deeply embedded historical processes. So consequently, an approach to social change that focuses predominantly on persuading individuals is inevitably limited. I mean, it's a necessary, but it's not a sufficient approach. To facilitate and secure changes in human-animal relationships, we must also achieve structural changes in social and political systems. And this is where the concepts of democracy and representation are critical to the way state power is exercised. Animals are excluded because they lack political representation, 
Both they themselves and their human advocates are shut out of the decision-making processes. And this is a failure of democracy in the sense that there is today an enormous gap between existing public attitudes and aspiration for animal protection and the grim reality of how animals are treated. And bridging this gap offers the most realistic prospect of achieving a paradigm improvement in the way animals are treated in the short to medium term. Indeed, in fact, all long-term progress for animals relies on institutionalising increasing degrees of protection in our social and political structures. And I think this is the roadmap to achieving progress that has, has been so far unprecedented in history, and it's the mission of um, our charity, the Centre for Animals and Social Justice. So this talk is effectively a summary of our analysis and proposals. So to give you an idea initially of the social and political landscape we're operating in, um, in my research I found this typology um, corresponds actually remarkably well to the, to the reality of this political conflict and debate over the last, um, well, 130 years, certainly if you just looked at the UK, uh, the UK animal experimentation policy alone. And the, the fact is there are two political positions or ideologies or discourses or whatever you want to call it that are practically relevant in terms of actual political purchase. So the first one is uh, what was termed animal use. I mean, I think actually the term animal use is, is a bit of a misnomer here. It's more, I think animal harm would probably be a closer, um, a more accurate description. Um, now this, this is the ideology which is adopted and pushed by animal use interests in farming, experimentation, etc. And in this, um, this kind of political ideology, animal welfare is almost completely subordinate to commercial or professional interests. There is an extremely wide definition of uh, to tolerated or necessary cruelty. And the policy aims of these groups are therefore to promote self-regulation and prevent animal welfare considerations from restricting their activities. And obviously that's politically relevant because it's all about them keeping power to themselves to make decisions over the lives of animals. Now, the other um, political ideology relevant in this uh, sphere is, uh, is animal welfare. And br briefly, in this kind of political approach, animal welfare should be given a significant weight in a utilitarian calculus. And this is the position of most members of the public, and it's the policy position adopted by most animal protection organisations. And the, the political aims here are tighter public regulation to introduce some kind of ethical and democratic considerations into the treatment of animals. And obviously there's, of course, a third philosophical position, which is animal rights. However, in policy terms, m most groups and individuals with this core philosophical position end up arguing along animal welfare lines in order to have some kind of purchase, some kind of positive impact, because political and cultural systems marginalise and denigrate this view, our view. So in reality, the kind of front line, the coal face of the struggle is in between the animal use and the animal welfare positions. In the UK at least, the hegemonic or institutionalised government approach is animal use, and that's in constant tension with the public's more progressive animal welfare position. So I will briefly explain why this is the case, and um, from that try and suggest some solutions to how we can go forward effectively. Um, now, in terms of my background as a campaigner and researcher, as, um, as Martin mentioned, I, I and uh, my campaign colleagues, we won a big legal battle against Novartis and kind of the UK government at the same time to publish leaked documents describing pig-to-primate organ transplant experiments. And the reason for our victory was the public interest in revealing wrongdoing on behalf of the uh, researchers and the government. In, in fact, what actually happened was that the, as soon as we won the right to legal representation, uh, the company completely caved in and we achieved all we wanted in terms of uh, the documents we wanted to put out without uh, going to court. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it was a victory. Now this area of animal experimentation is a classic example of how government and animal harm interests, how they managed to resist public opinion and animal protection through what's called the politics of symbolic reassurance, combined with the institutionalised exclusion of animal interests. Now, in Britain in 1986, new legislation was introduced, 
which appeared to in introduce a, a kind of ideological change, a paradigm change from the animal use position to animal welfare. And this was through the introduction of a cost-benefit assessment of research projects. Now, before, um, when the government gave permission for animal research projects, they didn't have to try and look at how much suffering the animals were going to undergo. They didn't have to look at whether the proposals had any scientific or practical merit. So there was a kind of complete discretion for the government to do what they want there. But this appeared to introduce this kind of quasi-ethical framework to at least consider animal welfare to some extent. However, there, have been, there are, or there were, and there still are, structural flaws in this policy area. First of all, the, the relative weights to be given to animal protection compared with research interests within the cost-benefit assessment were never defined in the law, which again continued to allow the government huge discretion in how it was actually implemented. Secondly, there were no changes to the implementing body. The inspectorate continued to be largely drawn from the animal research uh, community, or at least shared professional links with them. And also, there were clauses in the legislation which prevented disclosure of information about how animal research was regulated, inspected, and what the outcomes were. And this gave research interests free reign to paint a, an impression of what happened in animal experimentation, which to influence public understanding in their favour, so obviously downplaying animal suffering and exaggerating the effectiveness. And there were two factors, two underlying historically entrenched factors which allowed this situation to happen. First of all, there was government institutional disregard for animal welfare. So when the 19, in the sort of mid-1980s, when the government was deciding how to draft this legislation, there was no one within government saying, well, hang on, what about the animals? I think secondly, um, from the animal protection point of view, there was a naive, disunited and ineffective strategy. What they did was, list, was ask for a kind of list of discrete bans on types of testing rather than focusing on the more structural aspects of the process, which would have not only achieved the bans they were looking for, but a whole lot more. So this case study of uh, Zeno transplantation experiments shows the inevitable results of this policy area's structural flaws. Now, the, the research was conducted by a company called Imutran, who are a, a subsidiary of Novartis. And they managed to be given a, a moderate severity categorization, which uh, the law requires uh, experiments to be given a kind of um, an assessment of how much suffering they're going to cause. Now, under this moderate categorization, the experiments were not supposed to cause serious systemic adverse effects, especially not to the point of killing the animals as a result of the experimental procedure. And also, uh, on the kind of benefit side, the company claimed that they were to both the media and also in their, um, in their license applications to the government, they claimed that they were going to develop clinically viable pig kidneys and hearts for transports within a, uh, a year. And this was back in 1994-95. Now, in reality, um, the documents that were leaked to us, and we eventually won the right to publish, showed systemic breaches of the moderate severity limit. Um, and the Home Office, the government department that was supposed to regulate this area, had allowed to go unpunished for several years. So, I mean, this is just an example of some of the, um, uh, the, the clinical notes of the primates um, during the experiments. So these, this is enormous severity that goes beyond just a kind of biased e exercise of discretion in the operation of the cost-benefit assessment to outright illegality. So in terms of the supposed benefits, despite five years of experiments, um, the rejection processes for pig organs in primates were, weren't even understood, never mind controlled. And we, there was uh, 17 animals found dead, many more in a collapsed state, which was a clear breach of the moderate severity limit. So the fact that Imitran's research was permitted and then allowed to continue in spite of its ongoing failure to realise its legally uh, mandated objectives, it illustrates the harsh reality of the British government's animal use uh, approach. 
But yeah, it hides this behind this kind of animal welfare veneer in order to dampen down public concern. Now, uh, in farm animal welfare policy, um, to give you an idea of the scale of political failure here, the suffering of factory farmed animals was identified and criticised over 50 years ago in a historic report called the Bramble Report, which was commissioned by the UK government. However, recently the, the kind of government advisory committee on farm animal welfare observed that severe welfare problems remain unresolved because, in effect, um, economic and business interests are still being allowed to inflict gratuitous levels of suffering to hundreds of millions of animals in Britain every year alone. And to illustrate this huge policy area, I want to talk about a court case that was brought against the UK government by uh, an organisation called Compassion in Well Farming uh, in the mid-2000s. Now what this did, this challenged the use of fast-growing types of chicken because it inevitably causes chronic hunger in the breeding birds. Now the breeding birds grow so quickly that if they were permitted to feed freely they would be dead before they were sexually mature and able to breed birds to be actually uh, used for meat. And the thing is, um, the chickens reach, it takes three or four times longer to reach sexual maturity than what their normal slaughter weight would be, which is about, these days, is about 40 days. Now in order to deal with this, the industry feeds the breeding birds a one half or less of what the, um, the, the, the meat animals eat free, uh, freely, or, and sometimes it's as little as 20% of what they would normally eat. And this causes se severe welfare problems because the animals suffer um, constant hunger. And that's just one problem with broiler, the broiler industry. Obviously you've got the, the, the horrific leg defects, the ascites, you know, it's an intensely intensely cruel industry. Um, now, EU law says that animals must be fed a wholesome, healthy diet to maintain good health and satisfy nutritional needs, and also that no genotype, no breed of animal should be developed and used which has detrimental effects on its health, health or welfare. And the UK's own implementing regulations says that farmers must take all reasonable steps to ensure that the conditions under which animals are bred and kept comply with the requirements and that animals must be, sufficient, uh, must be fed sufficient food to promote a positive state of well-being. Therefore, the farming of fast-growing types of chicken, which is probably, it probably corresponds to the vast majority of animal suffering in modern societies, this farming appears to breach EU and UK laws, which on the face of it seem to ban unnecessary suffering. And hence, these laws give the public the impression that there is at least some control degree of control on cruelty. Compassion in World Farming's case was that the only way to comply with the law is to avoid rearing fast growing types of bird and instead use slower growing chickens so that the, the breeding birds are not chronically hungry and also at the same time it would mean they, they wouldn't suffer so much lameness etc etc. So this was an example of where the, the British courts had to consider the, the gap between the consensus that animals should not be caused to suffer for trivial economic reasons with the, the reality that, of, the, of the continuing existence of systems of farming that are guilty of precisely that. However, um, both the judiciary um, and the government sided uh, with industry and rejected Compassionate World Farming's case. And when you look at the judgment, Basically, the, the judges were saying that because fast-growing types of chicken were standard industry practice, that, you know, they weren't even going to consider whether they were unlawful. And from this position, they inevitably, went, they inevitably went on to find that the restricted feeding regime was not illegal, as in their view, a balance had to be arrived between mutually in incompatible welfare concerns. So in other words, the rule of law, as it would appear to a normal reading of it, is fundamentally undermined because its implementation becomes entirely conditional on institutionalised business practices. The ideology of maximising producti of, of productivity and profits is completely hegemonic within government and hence the judiciary. Now, I think one of the lessons from both these policy areas is that when animal advocates focus on specific policy areas, 
without structural changes that embed animal welfare as a major government value, then even when we appear to have made some kind of progress, in often those, those efforts end up being pretty futile because of the way these things end up being implemented. So, in both cases, the law gives the impression of an animal welfare approach while implementation results in an animal use paradigm. So the question is, why has the situation evolved as it has? Now, I found that a useful explanatory concept from the, the kind of academic public policy literature is the notion that policy evolves from the way interest groups and government deploy and exchange their political resources. Now, resources here has a broad meaning, so it doesn't just mean the, the amount of finances and money to spend on lobbying campaigns, but it also includes qualitative and structural factors, such as you know, how many helpful laws there are, whether public opinion is supportive, um, whether those interest groups have vital knowledge and information that the government needs to pursue its aims and, and to help society, um, whether the aims of that group are in alignment with dominant elite values and government power distributions, and also whether those groups um, contribute to or, or are perceived to contribute to national economic prosperity. So basically, the resources that you have are a good indication of how much political power you have. So, th I mean, the other thing to bear in mind is that the perceived or well, the way the government perceives the value of a group's resources in a policy area will depend on whether your resources contribute to that policy area's goals. Now, the problem is animal-related policy areas, whether it's farming, experimentation, etc., they come to be dominated by animal use interests and their ideology. Therefore, our resources, such as supportive public opinion and our extremely strong ethical arguments for animal protection, they end up having very little purchase in these policy areas because public accountability and animal welfare are seen more as hindrances than help by these policy-making communities. And that's, this is why animal advocates in the UK, for example, have had little or no influence and biased, cruel policy-making continues. And if animal protection representatives are brought in, it's usually as kind of isolated peripheral insiders on advisory committees, which end up lending some false legitimacy to a policy area, but they're actually kept away from actual decision making. Now the problem is, these, in, the, in the UK, these policy areas are very unlikely to reform of their own accord, because the people who are in these policy areas have no interest in reform. In fact, they go out of their way to block it. Also, there is currently little prospect of a powerful kind of external shock to these policy areas that would change their structure from animal use to animal welfare. And it's fair to say that we will, we will always lack the kind of economic muscle relative to animal use industries. And that in turn allows them to dominate related scientific professions because they've got far more money to spend on research, uh, sponsoring uh, activities, media relations, etc. And even the UK Hunting Act, which is supposed to ban hunting with hounds. Um, now, I mean, hunting is interesting because it's a little bit more susceptible to parliamentary pressure. It's not linked with a nationally important economic activity. But it is undertaken by established elites in British society with strong links to the aristocracy, etc. So the UK Hunting Act, which, which was supposed to ban hunting with hounds, was severely compromised because the power of the elite pro-blood blood sports lobby meant that the legislation was drafted in such a way as to make it very difficult to prosecute offenders, especially the traditional uh, red coat hunts. Now the overarching cause that links all these cruel policy systems is the lack of structural, institutionalised representation for animal interests within government. And this means that animal protection has little in the way of effective resources to counteract animal harm interests. There are a couple of resources that could be utilised to change these policy processes by counterbalancing 
the power of animal harm interests. Now, one, obviously, is public opinion. That's our kind of greatest resource, potentially, anyway. Now, first, public opinion could be brought to bear if the policy process that we're trying to influence were more democratic, were more open to public opinion. Now, ideally, this would involve the incorporation of deliberative democratic decision-making into animal policy spheres. Now, what that means is that the decisions are made uh, through some kind of representative sample of the public rather than a clique of industry insiders. These decisions would be made on full information and they would be made in the spirit of rational, respectful decision-making. And case studies show that these kind of processes, rather than the closed, secretive, biased processes, processes tend to produce decisions that are far more sympathetic to animals' interests. And uh, one example that uh, uh, Lucy Parry mentioned earlier uh, was uh, South Australia's state government's dog and cat citizens jury, which came up with uh, relatively progressive uh, recommendations, which gave the government there the kind of confidence to implement things like uh, mandatory desexing of animals, you know, measures that are perfectly sensible, but most governments don't seem to be bothered introducing. So open, have this deliberative, de uh, deliberative democracy process, on the one hand, you know, who could seriously argue with having a proper informed debate and, make, and basing decisions on that? So in a sense, if we focus, to some extent, if we as animal advocates focus on having a fair process, which is inarguable, that can open the door to much better outcomes for us and obviously the animals. So that's, that's one area, which is trying to bring public opinion to bear in this sphere. Now, the other um, kind of related set of reforms is to do with creating wider governmental support. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the current structure of the UK government, both legally and institutionally, prioritises competitiveness and deregulation over everything else. And there are various agencies and departments that sponsor the commercial interests of industries such as big pharma and uh, industrial agriculture. Conversely, there are no laws or institutions which establish animal welfare protection as a meaningful consideration. So, for example, Austria, you have an ombudsperson for animals in each uh, region, which is some kind of voice for animals and has some kind of powers. We have nothing like that at all in the UK. Now, this lack of voice or power for animals within government needs to be rectified. And our proposal is the, the establishment of a kind of government animal protection agency that could act as a voice for animals within the government machine and set an animal protection agenda across the whole of government. On a similar uh, kind of theme, the absence of any overarching laws that guarantee significant consideration for animal interests means that the animals are almost always sacrificed when they conflict with the interests of animal harm uh, bodies. So animals need to be granted some kind of overarching legal and political status in order for public policy to be less dominated by raw power and more influenced by ethics and democratic accountability. And another, um, a another area, a vital area of uh, policy making um, is the idea of having uh, strateg uh, government-wide strategies and targets for animal protection. Um, and there's a, a paper that I read uh, a while ago called, um, to do with this kind of area, which is called What Measures, uh, What Matters is What is Measured. And, you know, you see this across in international institutions, national, whatever. If there's something that the government cares about or is forced to care about, then they start setting targets, they have strategies to improve it, they have agencies that are charged with implementing these uh, improvements. However, once again, there is no strategy with targets to improve animal welfare within any part of the UK government. And this, this is both a symptom and a cause of the lack of regard for animals in public policy. Now, obviously, these significant policy changes at a structural level that would involve a paradigm shift from animal use to animal welfare are, of course, difficult to achieve. And I don't think that any one group is capable of, achieve, of achieving this on their own. So this is an area where collaboration amongst animal advocates is absolutely key. Uh, and this is a, a book that came out about a year ago that I contributed a chapter to uh, and many colleagues did as well. And in a sense, this kind of sums up uh, a new direction in um, 
certainly in thinking about animals in the academic sphere, in social science and, and philosophy. But I think I, I, I detect that it is indicating the change within the animal movement to realise that you know, we need to address issues of political and structural power if we are going to make significant gains for animals and actually, and actually, and actually consolidate those gains and continue to move forward. We need to institutionalise the protection of animals' interests within our systems of political power. And just to give you an idea of some of the potential gains of this approach, now there was a study, um, a massive research programme uh, called the EU, Animal Wel uh, EU Welfare Quality Study. And what it did, it was a huge democrat uh, deliberative democratic exercise involving uh, samples of members of the public from various European countries. And they were given information about um, the kind of ethical I issues around farming, uh, some facts about you know, what actually happens to animals in farming. And one of the interesting outcomes of the study was that the vast majority of members of the public had no idea what really happens to animals. And then they talked to animal welfare scientists, ethicists, vets, about um, you know, what, should the, what, what would be a kind of an ideal set of regulations for farm animal welfare going forward. Now, even though some of the animal welfare scientists were saying, well, you know, you, you know it doesn't have to be that strict, blah, blah, blah. Because of the information they'd received, the recommendations of, of the, the kind of, say these were representative samples of the public, if those recommendations were implemented, then basically half of the farms in Europe would be forced to close because they, didn't, they don't mean kind of the public consensus for animal welfare. Now, obviously, that, you know, that's never happened before. That would be a revolutionary advance for animal protection. And obviously, we're talking about the half of the harm, uh, farms that cause the most severe suffering to animals. So that's an idea. If public opinion, informed public opinion, was the thing that controlled animal protection, we would be in a very different place, and the animals would be too. Similarly, uh, public opinion polls show that half of experiments fail where the public sits on the kind of where the costs and benefits should be um, applied. So you can see from the potential gains here why the industry prefers self-regulation and put so much effort into secrecy and the exclusion of public accountability. And I think this recent statement from the Luxembourg government, in a sense it describes the essential political change we can and need to achieve. Um, and there's a, a little bit of reading for you, <laughs> light reading for you. Um, so as a kind of parting um, or, or concluding note, I think one of the interesting things is that now, in the UK, animal welfare has, has been an issue, a political issue, for almost 200 years. Um, and in a sense, our opponents have kind of, have, you know, they've managed to get extremely organised and consolidate their power. So they've got a very strong grip over these life and death decisions over animals, and they've got a very strong grip over the government machine. I think there are other countries, um, perhaps more in southern and eastern Europe, where animal welfare is only just emerging as a serious political issue. And when policy areas are new, there's much more flexibility and scope for setting them up in a way which gives you a much better chance of protecting animals and making advances in the future. So um, to all our colleagues and comrades in, in every country that you're in, I think the key the key thing is, is to look at the structural level for animals within your government and society. Don't just concentrate on specific areas. I mean, obviously, you have to do both. But it's, again, it's trying to figure out the correct balance, which is going to allow you to achieve those changes that you want and to then set up a foundation for continuing changes in the future. Because I think for British animal advocates, um, you know, we've effectively been banging our heads against a brick wall for 200 years, and it's getting quite painful. Um, so on that note, I'll finish, and obviously I welcome any questions. Thank you.